Now, it's my pleasure to present today's presenter, uh, Tim uh, Matanovich. Tim has experience with a number of leading B2B companies as both as a consultant and as a business leader. He's the former VP of Strategic Pricing and Value at the Trizetta Group and author of Profitable Technology Services Pricing. As Chief Enlightenment Officer at Value and Pricing Secrets, he helps commercial leaders get the most out of their value and outcome-based pricing strategies. So with that, Tim, welcome. Well, I'm happy to talk about outcome-based pricing. It's been an interesting conversation for me uh, uh, over the past decade with a lot of companies. Um, the place I wanna start though is just with one question. And that is, why do you want to pursue an outcome-based pricing strategy? And, and the reason I bring that up is that in working with uh, dozens of companies over a, a long career, what I found is uh, the most important thing is to, to ask the question, what are we really trying to accomplish here? And then find figure out what the right tool is. So outcome-based pricing is a tool that works in some cases and can help you achieve certain outcomes. But, but not others. And so uh, uh, be, be a little bit cautious as you think about implementation. Now, as a place to start, uh, I like to start always with the, a discussion of pricing belief systems. And I call them belief systems instead of models because uh, uh, belief systems are about how we think about solving problems. And so if we are an organization that's focused around cost-based pricing, um, then, then we immediately think about, okay, that's the model we use for, for solving our pricing problems or market or competitor-based pricing or value-based pricing. And those are the three primary models uh, that are used. And those are the cultures, the pricing cultures inside of organizations. So outcome-based pricing is really a subset of value-based pricing. And let's talk about the reason I begin with belief systems is this is a cultural issue. This is about how we think about solving problems. So outcome-based pricing, like I said, is a subset of value-based pricing. So if you are a, I assume uh, because you're on this call uh, with a leverage point that focuses on value-based pricing, I assume that you're, you're doing value-based pricing. But if you're a, a cost-based pricer and you're thinking about, well, I'm just going to skip over here into outcome-based pricing, um, you've got to do all the work that you do in value-based pricing in order to become an outcome-based pricing customer or okay, outcome-based pricing practitioner. Um, now, the line between what constitutes value-based pricing and outcome-based pricing is not crystal clear. Okay, if you think about outcome-based pricing, uh, we're going to tie our compensation directly to some outcome we're going to achieve. And we'll dive more deeply in that. But let's talk about a complex sale. For example, uh, let's say uh, you work with a client and the client says, okay, we're going to implement your software on three of our lines in our plant. And if everything works out uh, okay, then we'll consider uh, uh, expanding that to, to more uh, Plans. So now you've got a pricing question. How should you price as an on-freight price? And how should you uh, and you have to set a determination about what your long-term price might be. And if you think about it, what you're doing is you're saying what the customer is saying to you is based on the outcome of what we're doing is how much you're going to get paid and our utilization of your, your uh, 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 software. So uh, in this case, the line between value-based pricing and outcome-based pricing is not crystal clear. Now, also, most outcome-based pricing implementation are not purely outcome-based pricing. So for example, you'll have 90% value-based pricing and 10% of revenues may be at risk uh, in an outcome. And the final thing is that services are absolutely critical to success when it comes to outcome-based pricing. And many companies don't know how to value price services, they underestimate service requirements and costs and can get underwater with it, or, or even worse, um, they try and constrain the amount of services they provide. And as a, as a result, torpedo um, their, their business in the long term. And then finally, they lack service sales expertise and incentives. And this last one is really important. We've seen this in company after company after company. Companies may, may have a sales force that's really great at product sales, but, but those people uh, very often 
don't do a good job in services. So very often we see a service overlay, a kind of a uh, as a minimum, as a way, a service overlay sales organization uh, to promote services. But again, this is absolutely essential when it comes to outcome-based pricing. Now, let's talk about the uh, business impact of pricing models. Um, this, this data actually comes from an analysis uh, called the TSI market rate study of 24 professional service organizations um, that are embedded inside of technology companies. And what we could see uh, within those organizations is that as they move from cost-based to market-based to value-based pricing, the net income of those professional service organizations improved. And so the question I'm going to ask you as you think about outcome-based pricing is what is the um, a premium that you must capture in order to justify the incremental risk that you may incur as a result of tying your price directly to the customer's outcome. Now, the place to start here is what are outcomes? And we're talking, you know, as I said, you know, it's a, it's a uh, subset of value-based pricing, but value is not equal to outcomes. Value is the monetary impact on a customer's business. It's measured in dollars, in, in euros, in yen. Um, and, you know, if, if you're using uh, leverage point software and you'll see in there that it says um, that you have to define value drivers, value drivers are, are, are the value, the monetary impact on the customer's business and how, that, how, uh, uh, how you monetize uh, the benefits that you deliver but outcomes specifically are the measurable impact of the benefits you deliver that correlate with the value delivered. Um, and so it's going to be kilowatt hours of savings. It may be reduced downtime. It may be reduction in lost sales or increase in productivity, but those are not specifically value. Those are the measurable impact of the benefits you deliver. And the key here is that outcomes need to be objectively measurable and value is not. Value is virtually never uh, objectively measurable and you'll have different managers inside an organization who will say the value might be different. As you know, if you're doing complex B2B sales, you know, everybody in, inside the organization will value what you deliver differently. And that's just something you have to manage uh, during the sales process. So the point is, is that if outcomes are specifically objectively measurable impact of the benefits you deliver. Now, let's talk about outcome-based pricing specifically. And on the left-hand side, so I'm gonna talk about what it, how do I characterize it? What's the approach? What's the necessary information? What is the rule for success? And who would be the typical manager inside of your organization that would have ultimate responsibility for outcome-based pricing. Now, so what outcome-based pricing is, it's value-based pricing applied to a single customer where your price is tied directly to performance. So the approach is that you would collaborate, oops, did I, did I lose you? I just lost my screen, sorry. Tim, I can see your screen. Tim, I can see your screen. Okay, outcome-based pricing, sorry. Um, so the approach is to collaborate with the customer to estimate your expected outcome and deliver a price metric. Um, and so, so there's this collaboration in terms of approach and you agree with the customer on a formula for payment based on that metric. So the necessary information is really, really deep knowledge of the customer's business. That's the foundation. If you don't understand the customer's business in depth, you do not want to do outcome-based pricing. Then you need to have confidence in your and your customer's ability to perform and confidence in your customer's willingness and ability to pay. And I bring this up because, for example, uh, one of my friends is a consultant that always proposes an outcome-based pricing uh, model for his consulting clients. He'll say something like, uh, we'll, we'll, uh, uh, you can 
uh, pay us our normal fee of $200,000 for our consulting work, or we will take all the risk and we'll get paid at the outcome, but you have to pay us a million dollars. So you, when anytime you do this, you're going to have to think about if we put ourselves at risk and we're willing to do this, is that customer going to end up paying us or are we going to end up in some sort of a lawsuit at the end of the day? Most customers don't want like the idea of outcome based pricing. But when you think about the risk and you think about how much they might have to pay, they, they, they often say, well, actually, I'd just rather have you pay your fee. Um, so the rule for success on this. It's to deliver on an agreed outcome and get paid according to the terms of the agreement. Now, I, I make it a point here of more may not be better. And I want to go back to a really old example. That's a simple example that makes my point. Um, if, if we're talking about industrial solvents, for example, that are used to clean equipment, if, if the solvent is too weak, um, then it doesn't clean the equipment and the repairs go up. If the solvent is too strong, then the equipment, then it can erode, for example, the seals on the equipment, and again, causing increased maintenance requirements. And what you want, so it's, it's kind of like the three bears, what you're looking for here is the porridge that's just right. So your outcome may not be uh, something that's better and better and better, but rather it may have to do with more precision um, around, uh, around a particular point. And finally, there the typical manager here that runs this inside of your business that needs to be responsible for this is that it's a it's a strategy driven kind of uh, pricing approach. What I mean by that is you're putting the business at risk by doing this. So it's not specifically finance or product market management or marketing or sales. Now, so. The way I like to summarize all of this is outcome-based pricing is the strategy for strategic partners. Now, we've all seen um, one of the most uh, abused words in pricing. And we hear this all the time in sales, right? This is a strategic customer. So we need to treat them differently. We need some sort of an exception. And, and frankly, executives in many organizations are absolutely the worst at this, you know, uh, they, uh, but so when you think about outcome based pricing, the question is, is this really somebody that you want to climb in bed with and you're willing to to uh, uh, be that way with so thinking about who your target customer is, is really vital in outcome based pricing. Now, I'm going to use uh, go through a couple of examples here, and in both of them, you'll see kind of where what I said earlier was sometimes the the uh, line between value based pricing and outcome based pricing is not that clear. And so what you'll see in both of these cases is uh, is is that that scenario. These are both real case studies that that I've worked on, and these are both. Um, uh, 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 have been modified or, or anonymized um, so as not to reveal the real details of the, of the individual cases. Um, so the first one is for something called Sales Max to Systems. Now, this was for a company that provided uh, software for automobile dealers. And uh, there are different parts of the automobile dealership. There's, there's the maintenance bay, there's um, there's used cars, there's new cars, there's inventory. Well, sales max is for the front end of the dealership. And so the idea here is this was software that was intended for use by the salespeople and other people at the front end of the dealership in order to ma maximize revenues at the time of sale of new cars. Now, we used, in order to evaluate different pricing approaches, we used uh, something called a discrete choice research. And many of you, if you're value-based pricers, and again, I assume many of you are because uh, you're using leverage point or, or considering it, um, discrete choice research is an excellent tool that can be used in order to evaluate uh, different approaches to value-based pricing. Discrete choice research allows you to um, uh, it's an experimental approach that permits you to create an economic model whereby you can test alternative approaches. Now, on the left-hand side of this table is the alternative pricing strategies. So the first one is single price site-based. 
this was the existing model for pricing of this kind of software in this uh, in, in this uh, two car dealers. And so it was 2,300 bucks and it was site-based. So basically if you were a dealer and you had uh, five dealerships, then each site would pay 2,300 a month for, for the software. <clears throat> now, what they were considering is something maybe a two-tiered kind of price that because a lot of dealers are, are relatively small, they may only have one location, they don't sell that many cars, but uh, since site-based is the predominant model in the industry, they thought, well, maybe we can have first tier at one price and a second tier at another price. And then the final uh, approach was pricing on a per car sold basis, because if, if that's what they're doing, if if this is the idea is to maximize revenues, then it's it's all based on a number of cars sold. So if we can uh, price set a pricing model based on per car sold, then that would be outcome based pricing. And so they had we had a model for doing that. So if you look over to the right hand column, the far right hand column now on this sheet, what you'll see is that the single price site base was 59 million. And this largely corresponded to their revenue stream as, as it existed today. So it, it affirmed the economic model. And if you go down though to per car sold, clearly customers preferred to pay based on the number of car sales because that was more relevant to them. And so, and, and so they were essentially willing to pay twice as much if they could have the pricing based on a per, per car sold. Now, the this was a dilemma for the company because most of the companies in the industry already used a site-based model. So the question is, did they wanna be a disruptor in pricing and change the approach uh, 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 to how they priced um, in this industry? There's also other issues when you think about moving to uh, other kinds of pricing models or, or moving from pricing metrics, this can get very complicated inside of an organization. And I'll just use the dealership here for as an example. Um, or how, if we're going to do this, does that mean we price our maintenance software differently with a different metric than we price our uh, front end offering, uh, uh, different than we price our inventory mod, uh, software? So this can become um, a, kind of a a, a really a bucket of worms um, as you think about the implementation issues of, imp of changing the price metric that you're associated with. So that was one of the issues that, that they had to deal with. Now, one of the questions anytime you get involved with outcome-based pricing is how do you evaluate the risk? And the answer is, in this case, what we did is this was uh, done in about 2014, 2015. And so we had 10 years of history that we could, we decided to go back through. And the great thing about that is we could go right back through the Great Recession, which was occurring in 20, 2008, 2009, and 2010. And the question the management wanted to know was, well, if we had this pricing model in place over the last 10 years, then uh, what would what have been the implications? And so this model, each one of these bars shows the differential revenue of an outcome-based pricing versus a site-based pricing approach over a 10-year period. And what you can see across all of the bars is that in every case except for the year, I think it's 2009, for every single year, you were better off with an outcome-based pricing approach rather than a site pricing approach. Um, so, uh, but nevertheless, there were the other issues about changing your pricing metric that had to be considered. And the beauty of this is how do you evaluate risk? You know, we built this uh, this economic model uh, using discrete choice uh, 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 research in so that we could actually uh, construct, we could actually look in the rearview mirror and we could populate it with his, with historic data and actually look at the two uh, different pricing models side by side. Now, so how do we manage the risk of outcome-based pricing? Of course, you can look at history and model what kind of outcomes you might have achieved. Now, if you're working with a customer, um, the question is, will they give you that data? You know, they may not, um, or they may not give you all of it. You know, are there things they're not telling you that you, you need to know? Do you want to include a premium for unforeseen risks? I mean, of course, there are economic cycles that we just talked about, but what about something like COVID that comes out of the blue? Um, is, is there some sort of a premium you can include for that? 
Um, instead of going all the way to an outcome-based pricing approach, can you use value-based pricing and a price metric to approach outcome-based pricing? In other words, get closer to the end result without actually putting your, your uh, pricing at risk. Also be highly selective in potential customers. For example, during the 1990s, I spent the entire decade with uh, GE as my primary customer, um, uh, teaching uh, uh, market strategy and, and pricing with GE. And, and frankly, you know, uh, they were the paragon of, of excellence. And yet today, you know, if you look at over the last five years, they've really been hammered. And so when you think about potential customers, you know what, really, really look closely at this. It's an important issue. You can use contract terms, of course, to limit your risk. For example, um, you, you can create a contract term of two years. So for example, in, in this case, you would say, all right, we've, we're, we're going to go to an outcome-based pricing approach for the next couple of years on, on a percentage of our revenues uh, coming from you guys, and we'll see how that works. And in two years, we may wanna change, change the term of the contract. And finally, you can limit the overall percentage of revenue you put at risk. So we have had clients, for example, that would say, <clears throat> we're only willing to put 10% of our overall revenues at risk in outcome-based pricing contract. So they recognize the importance of doing those with strategic customers, but they also recognize the importance of limiting the downside risk. Because when you think about what you've got to do when you go to the street and you make your earnings reports and your, your quarterly reports, um, you, you can't say, well, we're doing outcome-based pricing, so we're not sure how this is going to turn out. So you, you, can't, uh, be, uh, you can't put that much of your revenues at risk. Um, now I want to shift from more of a product example to a managed service example. And managed services um, are those that where, and this, this can this is done in aircraft engines, it's done by chemical companies and other manufacturers, and, and often done with software. And there's a real shift in responsibility in managed services. That is, um, you're going from the health of the infrastructure and application under management from the customer's responsibility to the managed service provider. And this is this is probably where outcome-based pricing is utilized the most and has been utilized for years and years the most. Um, and so outcome-based pricing opportunities are especially important with managed services because customers are willing to talk about what the risks are, what they cost, how they should be shared. All that can be can be had a conversation of. They, their focus is squarely on outcomes and your business, your responsibility is to say, look, we can get you this outcome. We're better at it than you are. And so customers are inclined to be less price sensitive because they can see that you're both in the same boat paddling in the same direction toward a common outcome. And you can lower your costs and sustain your prices over time as long as you keep delivering on outcomes. Now that's all good news. But there's an important caveat. The services and products are different. With services, you don't make a service sale and established value at the front end like you do with the product sale. With services, it only works and you can only get paid like this if you keep making the value case over time. And let me illustrate. Okay, so you've sold into a company this managed service program. And you've gone, you've done your two-year contract, you're at the end of the term, and you're looking at renewing the contract. And what does your client say? Gosh, you've got everything spinning like a top here. Man, all the metrics are great. All, all the numbers are great. Man, we're meeting all of our cost, cost uh, goals. Everything is great. So the question, shouldn't we be lowering your price now since you've done all the work? And that's often what happens at the end of these kinds of contracts. So the point is, is you've got to be reinventing your value speech. You've got to be reinventing the, the ways in which you create value so that at the end of the contract, you're able to make the case again for why they ought to be paying for your service value. So unlike product value, service value must be proven and sold again and again and again. Now, uh, one of the reasons that companies decide to do this with managed services is for the point of competitive differentiation. That is to say, oh, sorry. 
That is to say, other uh, competitors won't do what we will do. We are willing, to, so you're willing to do outcome-based pricing is in fact an important element of your competitive differentiation. You're saying we're willing to be at risk and as a result, we are, we are uh, uh, that's why you should choose us. So in, this is a case that, that has to do with uptime. And so the categories of service are what kinds of functional components does the does the uh, uh, customer have that need to be uh, uh, we need to resolve? Um, what are the number of downtime options we want to offer? Uh, how many subscribers do we want to offer or users or uh, whatever the metric is there? And and are we willing to commit to SLAs with a downtime penalty? SLA service level agreements. I assume most people uh, on the call will understand those. Um, so we've got our company versus our competitors. And in this case, what we've decided to do, we're going to offer more up downtime options. We're going to offer a lot of subscribers and we're willing to commit to SLAs with a downtime penalty as relative to other competitors, including our in-house support. So again, one of the reasons to, so the point of this is that one of the reasons to um, use outcome-based pricing is for competitive differentiation. Now, um, if you're going to do this, then uh, here's, here's what this might look like. So on the left-hand side is an availability percentage. So this is the kind of uptime you're willing to commit to. And so there's four different levels of uptime. And then on the right-hand side, and, and what you'll probably find, by the way, on the left is that different kinds of customers are willing to commit to different levels of uptime. Uh, for example, in, in one industry I worked in, um, in the, uh, for example, in the microchip industry, if you think about the um, uh, major microchip manufacturers like Intel, uh, then um, they're really concerned with their plants being up and running 24 seven. So the idea of uh, availability, getting to that three and a half nines and better is absolutely vital to their business model. I mean, that's their whole business. On the other hand, and you may not know this, there are actually mom and pop shops in the microchips production business. For example, they, uh, they produce microchips for talking dolls. And, and so their goal, they don't need to be up all the time, but when they, when they do have to be up, they need to transition from dolls to electric trains, for example. They need to do that periodically, and they need to have sufficient uptime so they can produce, produce the batch of, of products uh, that they need to produce. And so the amount of uptime that may be ideal, ideal for an individual customer, and this may relate to segmentation, uh, is a uh, variable dependent. And so you, you need different levels of availability, uh, both for segmentation as well as for negotiation with an individual customer. Now on the right hand side of this is the downtime penalty options. And they can be, they can range from none, but we're gonna take a note if we do have some problems so that we can fix it, all the way up to if we're down for 30 minutes uh, during the course of a certain period, then we lose $30,000. So there's a variety. And the point I wanted to make here is that you need to think through this in advance. And that's really my, my point. The number one rule in negotiation is uh, know when to walk away, right? Anytime you're in negotiations, because once you get into the excitement of the process, <laughs> then, 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 you know, you're going to bet the farm and, 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 you know, things can go sideways on you pretty fast. When it comes to outcome-based pricing, you know, plan your outcome-based outcome options before you start, before you walk into uh, your client's organization. You know, what do you think might be doable? What are the options we want to consider? What are the penalties we want to consider? Have we done an analysis that so we understand the financial risk that we're putting the company in if we were to do this? Have we used our own data to look at some history about what, what my, our options might be? So the, the, the idea here is to plan your outcome options before you start. So in this case, now coming back to the, the point I was making earlier, if you're going to plan the outcome options before you start, now you're talking about sort of shifting more toward value-based pricing away from outcome-based pricing. 
you're trying to say, you know, uh, we understand our value here, and yeah, we're willing to put some at risk, but we want to we want to give you discrete options that you can choose from, which is exactly what you do in value-based pricing. And, and so you want discrete options that are each profitable, and and you want to understand your risks in each case. Now, um, okay, closing thoughts. As a subset of value-based pricing, outcome-based pricing has all the advantages and disadvantages of value-based pricing, but they are applied to a single customer. And so in some, some ways, it makes value-based pricing easier because you're only thinking about what can we do with one customer. Uh, on the other hand, uh, you are talking about putting yourself at risk. So that makes it uh, more complex and makes your, your analysis beforehand more important. With outcome-based pricing, you know, the big decision is whether this is a customer you want to get in bed with. And, uh, and that, that's, that's absolutely vital. And like I said, one of the most abused phrases in the pricing arena is this is a strategic customer. And, and as a result of those three words, you know, the, many sins have been committed. Um, if you do this, then, then this could be a good pricing strategy for strategic partnerships and can even be uh, a key to competitive advantage if you're willing to take on this kind of risk and do it routinely and do it uh, in, in a well-managed way. And the key question is, how do you manage the downside risk? and both real and perceived. And I talked about, you know, I, I talked a lot about the real risk, but there's this perceived risk. You know, on the one hand, as when you're doing value-based pricing, as you know, again, as since we're talking here with about uh, working with leverage point here, um, if you're talking about value-based pricing, you do want your price metrics closely aligned with the uh, value drivers inside the business. On the other hand, um, there's there's real skittishness in, in many companies about willing, do we want to actually come close to tying ourselves to business outcomes? And so, so not only do you have to manage customer expectations, but you need to manage expectations inside of your own organizations. And you may have some natural biases that will say, we don't want to do this. And, and so this, and this can relate to the kind of company you are. If you're a smaller company willing to take more risk, um, more earlier in the, in the stage of life cycle, then this might be something you're more interested in doing. On the other hand, if you're a more mature organization and uh, you're not looking for uh, to change how things are done, things are working pretty well and you don't want to rock the boat. And, and so you're looking more for incremental change and outcome-based pricing may not be as good a fit. So there's both real and perceived issues related to managing risk. Um, thank you for, for participating. <coughs> Excuse me, to uh, talk about me and value and pricing secrets. My mission is really to do just in time training, coaching and tools. I mentioned I did a lot of work with uh, GE during the 1990s, and they had a process called Workout. And Workout was really outstanding because it was amazing what you could get accomplished um, uh, when you brought the right people together and you had a focused conversation uh, with uh, some, some expert background on what the problem was to be solved. Again, very remarkable. Um, I'd ask you to please subscribe and give me feedback on my YouTube channel, uh, Value and Pricing Secrets, because I need the encouragement to keep publishing free content. Uh, I'm developing self-serve mini courses. So if you have a particular need and would like to collaborate, let me know. Uh, if you want to do something around outcome-based pricing inside of your organization, we can produce a two to four hour course and uh, we can do that live or by video and, and make your people experts for a day while you're making decisions around this kind of a topic. And please contact me if you want external perspective or case examples. I've worked with dozens of companies uh, on all sorts of pricing issues and have more examples and they're leaking out of my ears. So happy to uh, talk to you about uh, how you can deliver business results through value and pricing strategy. Once again, great chatting with you. Uh, hope you hope you got good value out of this presentation. 
Thank you, Tim, for sharing all of your insights. And um, like you mentioned, in addition to checking out his YouTube channel, um, I would also encourage you to follow up in the exit survey. Um, there's a checkbox to if you'd like to follow up, um, if you'd like him to follow up with you. So um, we can make that happen by just one click of the button. So um, check out that survey at the end of the session. Um, and if you do enter that survey, you'll also be entered to win a raffle for a copy of uh, Tim's book, Profitable Technology Services Pricing. So um, fill out the survey, we'll pick a winner and let you know if um, you're the lucky person. Um, so just to give everyone a couple minutes to enter the questions for the Q&A session, um, it's my pleasure to introduce Brian Hannon. Um, Brian's VP of Sales here at Leverage Point, and um, he's going to share a little bit about how our cloud platform can help support sales teams better engage in these outcome and value-based conversations. So, Brian, I'm about to pass it to you, so take it away whenever you're ready. Great. Thanks, Nick, uh, and thank you, Tim. Um, we, we do talk uh, with our customers about outcomes-based pricing uh, a lot, and certainly, you know, Tim. Tim mentioned it. There, there's, there's really evaluating a whether you want to do it at all. Which, as Tim mentioned, it's, it can be highly profitable, uh, but it also can be risky. And so, part of what our platform does is it allows customers to really sort of using the the math and quantifying things, sort of prove to themselves whether this is something that they uh, that they want to embark on. Uh, and then the second area really is figuring out. Uh, which customers it makes the most sense for. And you really have to go beyond the math to do that. Certainly the math is, is important, but there are other uh, criteria as Tim mentioned that are important if you're going to engage in this type of uh, a pricing strategy with customers. Uh, but really a big part of that is communicating that to those customers. So if a customer is going to consider making a shift in the way they do business with you, they need to understand A is, is going to benefit them. And they really need to understand the details because sometimes it sounds too good to be true. And um, if they don't understand the, the details of what's happening, they probably won't trust kind of making that big of a shift. So the other part of what Leverage Point does is being able to communicate that information directly to customers in a way that helps them become part of the process so that the, you're you're making an offer and making decisions with them really as a partner versus sort of sending them a proposal for a outcomes-based pricing engagement and just kind of hoping you get a yes or a no because uh, yeah, I think that's pretty much going to lose every time. So I'm just going to show you a quick example of uh, leverage point here. And I'm not going to go into a detailed outcomes-based pricing example. We're happy to do that with people who are interested. So uh, if you want, you know, feel free to contact us or a demo request, and we can set up a session to do that in more detail. Uh, but just to sort of tie into what I just mentioned, uh, Leverage Point allows customers to create value models, which can embed in both the value that you're uh, potentially providing the customers with your solution, but you can also embed in sort of decision tools to allow you to determine, hey, based on the customer profile, would this conversation about outcomes-based pricing even make sense? So this is an example of a very simple value model within Leverage Point that can be created and then used to communicate internally, really, about, hey, uh, are there certain uh, segments of our customer base where this makes sense based on the value and based on the particular drivers that we could you know, try to get, uh, you know, involved in an outcomes-based pricing discussion. Um, and, and so that decision-making tool is available here. But you can also then embed in this, uh, this value model into a value story. So what I'm showing here is an example of a value story that can be used directly with customers. Uh, so here we have a fictitious company called Airventus. And um, the people who've seen our value stories uh, a few times start to notice that we really sort of work in these kind of chapters. Uh, so all the stories have different types of chapters. But those chapters keep coming up again and again um, and, and can be used over again. This example here, we have an early chapter where a uh, this could be a salesperson configuring a system on their own. So this could be hidden from the prospect because they really don't want to uh, involve the prospect in actually creating the offer 
but you could in some cases maybe create the offer with the prospect so that they can kind of see the process. And so here, Airventus is a high-end heating and cooling uh, equipment manufacturer. And uh, maybe the salesperson is actually creating this with the customer uh, you know, live and showing them sort of how the, the offer uh, can be created. So then here we can provide some detailed information about, okay, here's the offer that you and I just created. I'm gonna turn off the highlighting there. Uh, and maybe we start to compare that to a, a comparative system from a competitor. Um, or this comparison could be, here's the offer that we created and here's our traditional cost for that offer, or here's a potential outcomes-based pricing offer. And it would allow the prospect to see the differences and maybe make some changes to the numbers to see how those differences would, uh, would roll out through a proposal. The great thing about having a value model included here is you can actually create gates within a value model so that uh, you know there's certain types of situations where outcomes-based pricing wouldn't make sense at all. And so a value model can limit the types of scenarios that you create so that essentially you don't get yourself in, you know, in trouble in front of a prospect. And again, I, we wouldn't assume that you'd be experimenting with this in front of a prospect. It's something that you would try beforehand and make sure the, the prospect would see a proposal and a presentation that would make sense. So the first set of uh, first chapter here could be sort of a configuration and some uh, information about costs. We would then potentially go into a value chapter. So now we have three key value drivers that we'd be focusing on. Uh, you'll also notice, and, and one thing I heard Tim say, which is important, there are certain value drivers that you would never want to include in an outcomes-based pricing proposal because too many people might disagree on what the, the data is. Energy may be one you could, you know, uh, an energy bill or a, a quantification of the energy costs that a uh, company is paying might be something that you could quantify and, you know, share between each other. And if there was an energy savings, maybe an outcomes uh, based pricing proposal could be a cut of that energy savings. Uh, downtime and maintenance may be a little bit harder to sort of get a good, uh, a good feeling on. So as we go through here, again, these are customizable. So the prospect uh, is hopefully part of the conversation and hopefully they are uh, participating in the story. And as the story changes, they can see the value uh, change. So here we have uh, sort of an estimate of the value that's been created. We dig down into each of the value drivers here to uh, make some estimates on what the value uh, would be if they went ahead with a, a system. And then there's a typically a sort of a summary uh, set of slides which can tell the story in different ways based on how you want to do that. And that's part of what we help our customers do. Um, here we have uh, a, a, a waterfall chart that can really show the fact that um, our system is more expensive than the competitive system, but we're generating so much additional value that even though the customer might be paying more for our stuff, they're getting a lot more back in actual savings. So different ways to present this data, um, and we can use sort of the traditional kind of TCO charts, as well as really any kind of visuals or graphics that you think make sense. Um, and then as usual, once you've presented this with the customer, they've hopefully participated in the, in the data, then we can save it so it can be saved back into the system or we can and or we can download it into like a PDF or a PowerPoint that can be then sent off to the, the prospect or the customer. So now they have really a, a version of a business proposal that they participated in, which gives them a good reason why they should do business with us. And it's something that they can then hand to their management, maybe their CFO, uh, and is a good example of a decision that should be made you know quickly and a decision that should be made um, in in with a good you know good prospect of uh, of getting a good return. So here we have the the exported PDF. It took a you know a minute or so to to uh, to spit out. So I think that's what I wanted to show you. Again, we're happy to go into more details about outcomes-based pricing. 
um, feel free to, uh, to request some time and, and we can spend some time in a session similar to this to do that. So I will pass this back to you, Nick. Thank you, Brian. Um, and thank you for presenting, um, connecting that to Tim's presentation. And then just as a quick reminder, you can also request a demo in the exit survey. So um, mm -hmm. if anything there sparks some interest or um, you think might have a useful application in your organization, just uh, feel free to tick off the box that you'd like to see a demo and we can spin up um, something custom for your um, instance. Uh, so Tim, you ready for the q and I am now. Let's do it. All right. So question number one, um, are there any industries in particular where you've seen outcome based pricing take off in popularity? And are there any that, you know, you might see strong opportunities for emerging popularity in the next five or 10 years? OK, so uh, in, in terms of uh, popularity, you know, I can only talk about the, the number of companies that I've worked with. And and the focus is really around when you the fastest growing uh, revenue it, when you look at and my expertise is uh, doing a lot of work with B and B and technology companies is this area of managed services that the example was um, this is the fastest growing uh, revenues and service revenues uh, uh, areas of business so that's the place it, it doesn't any any industry can get involved in this if they want to take that step and and but those are the kinds of applications where where i see this uh really taking off that makes a ton of sense and then especially in the context of the increasing serviceification of the economy um there seem to be broad opportunities for broad application um you know across different industries uh so um, have you seen um, certain types of risks that you've seen clients uh, fail to anticipate when structuring these outcome-based contracts, agreements, et cetera? Um, <laughs> I'm going to come back to what I said about strategic customers. It, you, uh, that, that's the risk. I mean, I was, I was delivering a seminar for the American Marketing Association a number of years ago. And I was talking about the economics of discounting. And, and you know, we've got a lot of people here that do value-based pricing. And, and you can understand, you know, that a, a 1% uh, uh, discount in price can very easily translate into a 5% uh, cut in profitability. And uh, I was in the middle of this class and I was talking about the economics of this. And, and uh, uh, one of the participants came up during a break and he said, let me ask you a question. Is that really true? And I said, yeah. And he said, oh, no, I got to call my CEO. He was just on the golf course talking with one of our customers and gave this really big price discount. And I don't think he understands what that's going to do to our profitability. So so that's the that's the one is is that take a very hard look at who you want to get in bed with and then look at the economics of the decision before you do it um uh it, I, I, more than one company i've run into have, have done done a pricing decision and then you know two years later their costs are under they're underwater their costs are higher than expected they've got people working on site to try figuring out how to pay them and, uh, and and but they're based on the contract they, they they have to deliver or you know they'll they'll get bad reputation in the market so that, that'd be my my guidance on that makes sense um we had a clarifying question earlier in the webinar about cost per unit um uh uh measurements and uh would you say that's a part of outcome-based pricing or the larger subset of value-based pricing as a discipline cost per unit <clears throat> Oh, I see. Um, well, um, so you can make the value-based argument claim that you're you're going to be able to help a manufacturer reduce their cost per unit, and they pay you a fee for whatever your process is, whatever your hardware or software or process is that helps them do that, and that's traditional value-based pricing. Um, you're making that promise and over time, what you're still going to have to do is demonstrate, right, and document that they've gotten that because that proves that they've done it, but your price is not at risk. Outcome-based pricing says we are going to reduce your cost per unit over the next 12 months by 5%. And if we don't do that, 
then we're going to we're going to uh, pay a penalty for not achieving that target. That would be the outcome-based pricing uh, approach to that. So you need to make the call. Do you are your is your price at risk or not? That's really the defining line for outcome-based pricing. Makes complete sense, and I think that's a good um, good example of the distinction between um, the subset of outcome-based pricing under value-based pricing. Um, some best practices questions in terms of, um, I think when you're referencing uh, the need to communicate value, especially in the context of services on an ongoing basis, um, do you have any thoughts on strategies for communicating that value on a, on a consistent basis? Yes, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you two things. <clears throat> the first one is, um, I recently uh, took my son's, I had to help my son uh, get his car repaired. He needed new brakes. And uh, when I drive down this road near his house, I see car shop after car shop after car shop. And, and you know, uh, so I had the choice of literally dozens within a mile of his house about where to take his car for being repaired. But as I drove down the street, one of the, uh, one of the signs on the street uh, uh, had a display, right? Uh, uh, a crystal display. And the sign said, we have 1,250 five-star reviews from our customers. And after I saw that sign three or four times, and then they said during, uh, during uh, 20, 2021, so far in the first half of the year, they've got another 150 five-star reviews. And so this was something I could say, look, all these people are going to charge about the same thing, but you know, this is really relevant to me. How do I distinguish between... 20 different auto shops? Well, the answer is obviously this has got a lot of satisfied customers. And so I would trust my car, my son's car to them. So, so that's a very practical example. The question becomes what is relevant and meaningful to your customers right away? Now, the second part of that, and that can apply to products or services. Second part of that to answer that question is that, um, in services, you need to continue to maintain uh, the value, and so there is there are tip, there's what's called the layer model, and some of you may have run into it: land, adopt, expand, renew. And the idea is that during the sales process, you go through these four stages, and this not this applies as well to products that are sold as a service, as well as uh, a pure services and some combination. And this is bottom line for you. If, if you're adopting a as a service model of pricing for your products and your products, then you are moving to a services business. You cannot treat your products uh, as products when you move to a SaaS model. So uh, if you want to talk to me about that, call me and we can have a conversation. <coughs> That's a little off point, but but I, uh, it's an important point if you're thinking about a SaaS model. Now, the layer process. What it recognizes in an as-a-service environment uh, is that you're going to go into a client. Let's say you're you're bringing a, a, a new software to market or bringing a software product to a new customer. And the customer says, yeah, I'm willing to try that. You know, you'll get the functional manager, say, say the marketing manager says, well, yeah, I, oh, okay, we'll use leverage point. <laughs> we'll say leverage point, you know, yeah, we like the idea. We think this is pretty good. The marketing guy says, yeah, this is good. Pricing manager says this is good. So we're going to try it. We're going to try it for the next six months with this particular business unit. And if this works out, then we're going to move it to the next, to, to a, uh, 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 we'll move to the next level and maybe expand it to a second or third business unit. Now, if you do that, then what do you have to do? You, you, the question is what price you're going to charge at the front end. And typically, you want to want you may want to say, well, we're going to we're going to do it uh, a lower price at the front end to get this trial. Now, the problem with that is that you don't want to set yourself up for this price in the long term. So there's got to be a conversation at the front end as we're doing a trial, but this is our ultimate pricing that we're going to get to. So you need to get that confirmation up front. Then you move into an adoption phase. The adoption phase is where you make or break in that trial. So your services, you may be underwater with services during the adoption phase because you're trying to persuade this customer that this is really good stuff and they need to use it. So then you get the adoption. 
then you've got to go to the expand. Now, what, what the expand is, okay, now we're going to roll it out to business unit number two, we'll roll it out to business unit number three, roll it out to business unit number four. And then finally, after the course of your original contracts, at some point, they're going to say there's renewal, but then they're going to say, well, you know, everything's working really fine. Do we, do we really need to pay you this much money? And so this is the this is the four stage process when it comes to services. That's the way you need to think about it. You need to think about it as a long term kind of sale that you've got a number of sales interventions and you need to make sure your salespeople are capable of making that sale and you need to make the make sure the incentives are aligned with that kind of a sales process. Sorry if that was a little bit long winded. Hope no, that point. actually, um, I think you answered another question that I had ready along the way. So um, that's 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 perfect. And I, I'm really glad you brought that up because um, that is something we talk about here at Leverage Point all the time is um, in our in our world, we would call these value conversations or value stories and the importance of having these not only during the sales process, but also during the entire customer life cycle, right? Because it's uh, it's, it's really all about, especially in a world where we're become, there's more services and everything and, and SaaS is becoming a more popular it's so much it's so important just to have those value conversations on an ongoing basis just to you know really convey the value that you're delivering so um, i'm super glad you brought that up and and, and to add on to this the, the concept of value stories is really a powerful one because um in in some cases um customers understand the value in, in many many cases they don't know and so your ability to communicate that, your ability to tell the story in a convincing way is really vital to that, vital to your ability to capture the price. Because there's not only the actual value delivered that you can demonstrate in a model, but can I get behind this? Can I relate this to people in my organization? Can I take your presentation and travel with this presentation to other people in the organization and they'll get it? So, so those are things that come to mind and, and why I think value story is really important. Right, and you said that probably better than I ever could. And I think that's a great segue um, into what we're gonna be talking about next month, uh, which is um, our presentation. We're gonna have uh, Michelle Vandenberg join us. Um, he's um, AVP Marketing at Agilent Technologies. And he's gonna be talking about um, creating um, a, a process called Design to Value creating value propositions that can use as these value stories to communicate, sell, and grow. Um, this is going to be a really exciting webinar. Um, and if you'd like to uh, pre-register, you can do that in the survey along everything, alongside everything else you can do. So uh, we'll make it nice and easy for you and we'll get you pre-registered uh, when we have that ready. Um, so I think that's all the time we have for today. So I, I really want to thank Tim for all of his insights and um, from all of us here at Leverage Point, have a wonderful rest of your week and um, take care.